Okay, I'm back with my good friend Stan um, in Moscow. I'm in New Zealand. This is Tate. I'm uh, hosting a, a live show here that we will cover some important events happening geopolitically with Russia. Uh, investment opportunities always are underlined here. And I'm with my good friend Stan Grafsky, who's in Moscow. He's got his boots on the ground there with investors. Um, he specializes in bringing foreign investors into Russia. And he's done that for close to 30 years. He knows what he's talking about. He's a lawyer, he's a businessman, he's a consultant. Um, he's a trustworthy guy. He's the kind of guy that can guide you, no matter how experienced you are, he can guide you into channels in various inter in industrial structures can sign contracts. Um, he can pave the way for you to get there and then take you through there for the contract um, um, negotiations and coordinate follow-ups as well. So he is your man on the ground for hire and he's a good guy, a lot of great references, a lot of great experiences. Stan, how are you doing? Thank you, Tate. Not bad for the Russian home country. Um, yeah, well, Russia's in the news every day. Uh, they've got fake news, and CNN got into a lot of trouble recently by admitting that they were faking the, the, the propaganda against Russia. There's a guy that did Project Veritas. That's been in the news. I follow that side of things a little bit, maybe more than, than you do. It's interesting for me. But I know you've been into this St. Petersburg International uh, Economic Forum. You've given me a, an agenda here. We, we briefly talked about it. And um, you're, we're going to cover the Trump, uh, the, um, the counter measures for the sanctions, the Trump meeting, and Vietnam as a test bed for other countries that may be jumping on to this train, as, as, you, as you said. Um, do you want to um, start off, or should we should we cover? I mean, I, I also have some things geopolitically. It, it looks like things are just coming to a head more and more. I, every time things escalate, I think, well, that's it. Now we're going to either have a conflict that gets to a hot war, or we're going to have uh, finally some level heads prevail, and we'll see common sense, and and they'll they'll finally allow Russia a normal position in the world, which that's all they've wanted. That's all they've said they wanted. That's all they've demonstrated they've wanted. All of the accusations have proven to be false. I could go on and on. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Let's go to the main issues on your agenda, Stan, because I know you have a good program here for us. We're going to talk about the St. Peter's. What happened at that St. Petersburg International Economics Forum? I know it was a, a big event. What happened there? Well, thank you once again for such a pleasant introduction. I didn't believe it is about me. Anyway, um, so yeah, uh, if we talk about St. Petersburg Forum, which took place a month ago, uh, actually it's months already, a month passed after it. Uh, it is, now we can uh, <clears throat> look at its results and it's very interesting. First of all, uh no matter it uh, origin uh, originally comes from russia it is international event uh famous for gathering um, most prominent prominent politicians in this country uh leading in most innovative businesses at least those who want to join and this year and international players who are interested in checking the grounds, mm -hmm. meeting directly with decision makers, both in business and in politics, <clears throat> uh, observing hot discussions. And one of those was Mr. Putin discussion with Megan, once again, Rayleigh. Kelly. Uh, Megan Kelly, I forgot her family name all the time. It was really, really uh interesting discussion which i think glued half of the country because it was quite on what on one hand was one well, provoking but on the other hand it uh, 
at moments I was feeling I'm really proud I'm Russian because Putin behaved really balanced, but the arguments were absolutely unbeatable. Uh, but nevertheless, a part of the uh, a part of the my feelings as a as a Russian, most important thing I think for those who've been there, at least watched it, is rather as a, um, a litmus test for everyone who, no matter which size it is, in particular, and uh, last this year for a set, not only for blue chimps and big players, but also for small and medium enterprises. It, it, it makes a lot of sense to, to watch what's happening. Uh, and the biggest lesson came out of this uh, forum was, a part of being the most represented, it's over 14,000 uh, uh, attendees, yeah, participating parties. Uh, with the biggest delegation from the United States, which was not supported in the last few years by previous administration, and it was a really, really striking sample how many businesses came here from, from the States. The most represented was the United States. Yeah, which in the previous years, Obama's administration put every pressure, directly and directly, to stop those guys, or at least allow them to send their representatives, but not CEOs. And uh, this this year, it is completely different. And uh, but most important, I think, message out of this forum, and in particular after meetings with Mr. Putin and his minister, who were over thirty ministers, were represented here. Uh, and available for direct discussions, not to mention the Russian businesses, of course, on their stands in, in, in discussion panels and discussion clubs, is that Russia as a country uh, brings more and more uh, incentives for international players to play fair game in on, on this market. So, and uh, one of the key messages very topical one with clear agenda how it could be applied is about digital economy as i call it mantra by putin he announced at this forum saying from now on and uh, the biggest focus of the russian government is digital economy digital so investors economy investors out there should be listening to this if putin and all of russia is behind putin these days i mean and Putin is say, driving uh, technology, um, that's got to get some people's attention. And people would be wise to try to be first if they can, see where their niche is, investigate, look at the opportunities. They have full support to get in now and less restrictions than before. This is an opportunity. Absolutely. And uh, I think uh, you know, namely, it might be a, uh, huge opportunities for, let's say, Silicon Valley IT companies immediately, uh, or anyone from any part of the world who can bring technologies or know-hows which are likely either not present in this country or rather competitive, and uh, government supports that backs up with the government funds, which is probably the most important message from Putin and his ministers. It's not just words or intentions. It is about a structured approach to mm, stimulate everyone who can uh, bring uh, technology solutions into this country and put it in play. And, from the ground point, or let's say uh, practical point of view, I would say the only uh, point to keep in mind is that uh, you just need, as a market entrant, think about medium to long term investment, not necessarily the um, uh, big one in terms of the value or you know, billions or millions, it doesn't really matter. It's more important is your approach to come here and expand on this market. Why? Mm, for a very simple reason. Uh, Mr. Putin wants to support 
local taxpayers. Even taking into account the tax burden here is relatively, well, in my opinion, comparing with, let's say, continent or advanced countries, uh, definitely, uh, no question asked, lower than on an average with other countries. Uh, not to mention personal personal income or entrepreneurs. Uh, well, I have a few entrepreneurs who register here these days and prefer being on a Russian tax tax uh, burden paying 6% from sales and nothing else uh, rather than be from sales and nothing else that's no that's we nothing yeah no income tax anyway once you clarify yourself as a small business player well it's obviously focused to small businesses with sales under 1 million euros approximately a year which is very helpful to those with knowledge or know-how yeah. um, and for know -how big players, it's still it's still very inexpensive how does it go if it's more than a million uh, euros well you cannot be uh, you would go into another scale so-called general tax scale which means uh, VAT of 18% applies plus uh, income of profit tax at twenty percent. Okay. But once easy. again, once again, uh, Russian VAT is the second the lowest after the UK in Europe, mm, and twenty percent it's still more than reasonable. But what is not visible at first sight, many regions and governments in this country, in order to attract players from outside. Uh, allowed to reduce this tax burden by 19% out of 20. And that is done intentionally by the federal government and Mr. Putin just to put them in competition. So if in you other, guys in other words, the, Putin has given the right of regional governors to reduce the tax burden from 20 all the way down to, sorry, to uh, 1%. Yeah, kind of. So in this case, you know, local governments would not receive direct taxation from the profit tax, but they would receive additional benefits from uh, extra employment, from uh, uh, individual income taxes and so on and so forth. And we already have experience, let's say, from uh, Kazakhstan, or Kazakhstan, sorry, uh, Tatarstan is the most striking sample where local government uh, in the last number of years was supporting international businesses. And uh, if you look at it, it's a kind of, uh, well, to me, it look, looks like a Mecca or, you know. <sighs> Kazakhstan has gone through a lot of changes and Moscow is unbelievable. The pictures I see there, I can't believe it's, it's actually exists the city because when I was there in the you know I left in 2007 it's a completely different city in just a short period of time in St. Petersburg the same thing well a lot then of business are transformation coming. yeah so uh, the key back to the forum and what uh, international players might be interested or at least consider keep in mind in terms of uh, their uh, international investors definitely keep uh, this country in mind again digital economy uh, mantra and anything in the advanced technologies is one story but don't forget about the the rest of other industries and niches uh, which are still huge and a lot of opportunities. So, forum was here to uh, here to articulate Mr. Putin's direct address to American businesses in the discussion club when they got together. Uh, what he said: "Please help me, your business leaders. Please help me to." bring my message to your political decision makers we're losing opportunities we have opportunities here we need your knowledge and skills and products in other words what he was saying we have money yeah but we well, need you here the the media is not helping getting the message out the politicians are not helping getting the message out the west has an agenda and um there's a, a some stories about 
about that. In fact, that's a constant theme in the alternative news about this horrible anti-Russian agenda being pushed by globalists uh, against uh, against Russia for certain agenda uh, mission, missions that they have articulated over over many years. You know, basically one world government is what it comes down to. And that's not a conspiracy. That's that's an actual fact. And Russia is a target, and Russia knows this, and China knows that they're not far behind, if they're behind at all. Um, but what you're saying is that Putin is talking directly to the leaders of industries in the U.S. And the U.S. was the largest represented this year, which is a big difference from the Obama administration. And technology is leading the way. There is money. Uh, put forward for these people and huge tax benefits. And all he asks in return is become a taxpayer. We have low tax. We have great benefits. Don't, don't think of yourselves in like 90s during Yeltsin era, era where you can come in, sell and expatriate all your profits and say goodbye to Russia. That, those days are gone. Putin wants a fair deal. Yeah, correct. Well, and those who are present here for, for, for many years already know that it's, it's, uh, all the opportunities are, are all here. Uh, well, I, I just repeated what you said, so that's really great. Thanks for giving all that out, Stan. That's fantastic. Um, any other notes you have on the SPEIF? Well, <laughs> in, my, in my opinion, uh, well, the f first of all, it was a really great... Uh, a platform for those who are really interested in this economy, even just for checking the grounds, because uh, it was a plethora of uh, media reviews and independent reviews by participants from a number of the countries uh, represented there who got the feedback from the players and uh, ironically a lot of regional and other words, provincial businesses were rep Russian represent, uh, uh, representing their products at, at, the, the, um, at their stands, spontaneously uh, establishing partnerships with uh, quite a big number of international players, businesses. Uh, uh, that's what was articulated already in the media. Well, I'm not, uh, I don't remember at the top of my head those names, but even in terms of the number of deals concluded, it is the biggest in 20 years' history, the biggest, uh, um, biggest f event. Well, basically, we're talking about uh, dozens of billions of dollars of deals concluded. Uh, it's something. Uh, and, uh, to be truthful, yeah, let's say half of them uh, realistically government-backed. That's for sure. In particular, in the priority industries, that's that's no wonder. But nevertheless, it's also a great opportunity to 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 pit, meet real uh, business players here and uh, get your own feedback of what is happening here. And we saw that a number of quite quite a lot of a big number of those deals which are uh, when asked they say no comments uh, the deal is concluded but no comments I understand in particular in those very sensitive technology or IT industries every day counts realistically and you have to keep your mouth shut until your launch or something like that so. That's one of the keys, I, I think, uh, interesting events which are very much open in terms of the materials on the, on the media, on the internet, uh, including in English and French on, on the, the we website, plus tons of comments, and any, anyone who is interested can uh, look for Google SPIEF, 2017, which stands for St. Petersburg International Economic Forum 2017, or anything related with that. It's uh, very interesting. Uh, There's a lot of information on that subject out there, and it was uh, almost overshadowed by Megyn Kelly's performance, which was seen to be quite 
humorous. Um, and it, I think it went a long way to expose just how fraudulent the Russian anti-Russian sentiment is from the West and from the media in particular and from politicians. She probably would, uh, I don't think the KGB or Putin or any number of people with any amount of money would have done a better job of explaining how bankrupt the ideas are for having an anti-Russian sentiment built up to such feverish uh, levels as, as what they've done. They've made it into bombshell news that Russia's interfering with elections, Russia's so bad doing so many things that they're everywhere. It's, it's, um, it's absurd. And, it, and the absurdity was presented so eloquently by a person who tried tried her best to present it uh, as a factual uh, issue. And, and Putin did perfect by not getting defensive, just simply explaining himself in very clear language. She, she, her tactic is to force someone to answer a question four times, and then she'll use the worst answer. Even if the answer is a, a stalled response, she'll take that stalled moment and show that the person's indecisive, even if it's his fourth time or her first, fourth time. That's her tactic. But she's playing these children's tactics against a very experienced, intelligent, and, and, and strong man. Let's just face it. He's dealing with real issues in a real country that deals with things in a serious way. She's absolutely no threat to him. Personally, um, he had no problems managing that. I thought it was fantastic, and the internet went alive with that one. So if SPIAF wasn't on the road map before, it is now, and Megyn Kelly is probably there to thank. And Obama's there to thank, just like you said before, for making Russia a self-sufficient country, which is one of the things that I've got in my articles. Russia is actually the most self-sufficient country on the planet right now. They rely the least on other countries for what they need day to day. 11 time zones of sufficiency. Okay, you had another, you, should we go to the next, <clears throat> is there anything else you want to talk about with uh, SPIF? Well, the, we can talk about a lot of issues, but it's uh, kind of a, a rather uh, detailed uh, issues or topics which might be of interest to very, let's say, focused people but basically the key message i think well as far as i i, I understood this uh, the, this event uh, i think we already covered pretty much covered so the rest could be found on, on the internet okay it was successful and it's technology and there's opportunities for investors and stan is the one who can either hold your hand from from the airport uh to the boardroom or he can plug you into certain aspects as needed on by contract uh, and Stan I know you can deliver I've, I've heard the stories um, let's go to the Russian countermeasures and the sanctions let's begin with that if you don't mind Stan how did these sanctions get into place I mean did Russia invade Ukraine because I, I saw an article put out by uh, Russia Insider where someone archived all of the different times and I'm in New Zealand now I've seen the newspapers Russia has invaded Ukraine, Reuters, AP, uh, New York Times, LA Times. And they put it again and again and again. They counted, I forget now, but it, it wasn't the full, for the full three years. I think it was at the two-year mark. They had already something like 150 headline stories, not just, not just uh, in one paper. I mean, stories that covered the earth about what Russia is doing in Ukraine over and over, waves of them covered by everyone and nothing. Who's in Ukraine? NATO, <laughs> with all their tanks and, and, and soldiers and, and um, contracts to frack uh, the eastern part that they are bombing, that they're paying the Ukrainians to bomb. I mean, I'm smiling. It's horrible. It's, it's many people actually dying. It's a horrible thing that really frustrates and angers me. But when I put it in a comedic uh, approach, I mean, these, who do these guys think they are? The, the sanctions came from blaming Russia for a lot of things that Russia didn't do. And the main, the main one was Ukraine related. And uh, then it flipped over to uh, the, uh, Syria 
and then to electioning. It just goes on and on. They, they'll never stop. They'll never stop until, well, I don't know until when. I would have thought they had stopped a long time ago. But it's just a few people showing that the planet is run by a few people. That's the unfortunate thing that we've got to wake up to. And, but people like you and I, Stan, and our audience and other people like us, they're out there on every level, different levels, different segments, and the wake up is here. And that's a good thing. And it, it, these guys are so bold and so brutal and so horrible with their focus on profits and making death happen to get more profits. Um, they're only exposing themselves and uh, the time for a change is here. It's people like you and I that are going to make that change in our own small way. Other people in bigger ways, that's fine. We're all part of the same team of humanity. So Russian countermeasures and sanctions. What are we going to do about that, Stan? What, how do you want to introduce that? I've done, I probably messed up your introduction. No, no problem at all. Uh, yeah. Uh, realistically, yesterday on uh, July 5th, I placed in my as my update a short uh, publication on uh, Russian countermeasures with Mr. Putin's picture at the top so anyone who is linked in uh, or Google Plus user can easily found that which gives a brief pre-story if you like story about these sanctions and Russian counter sanctions because a few days before Mr. Putin signed uh, a countermeasures decree call it that way which prolongs uh russia countermeasures against those countries who initially enforced that uh, against russia allegedly for 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 involvement into ukraine uh, i have my own obviously approach to ukrainian topics uh, but uh, i'd rather keep my mouth shut because I, I would probably be much more uh, radical than balanced tate <laughs> <laughs> Am I balanced? Oh, that's great news. Uh, uh, tell, tell my tell my family. <laughs> <laughs> because my approach is uh, sometimes is put your nose out of my hands. That's my approach to any involvement because Ukrainian and Russians are the same people. That's ironically, historically, the same. And uh, when someone tries to put the nose and teach the others, it's just my my approach is just if you know just just imagine that it's absolutely unbelievable scenario. But let's say Russians get involved into Mexico, change the government, dictate it, and try to do something on the uh, Texas border, it would be the same. Can you imagine that? Yeah, yeah. But and we then, have the same story. And then Russia <laughs> would blame. And then imagine Russia would finance. Uh, the re uh, the uh, new government of Mexico that they installed as puppets to actually bomb every day Americans that are living just inside the Mexican border and then telling the U.S. Uh, that they're attacking Mexico. That's yeah, how silly that. it is. It's, it's so it's silly, it's absurd. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's complete absurd. But, you know, out of it, even out of this political situation, uh, Western sanctions against Russia and the Russian countermeasures or counter sanctions, um, I always try to make a practical sense out of anything. And uh, out of it, uh, that's definitely, and the previous, if, if you remember the story, the Russian countermeasures against a list of the countries who were bringing those sanctions onto Russia at the beginning of 2000. In August, if I'm not mistaken, early August or late July uh, 2014, Russia enacted and forced those countermeasures. But what the uh, outcome of those, uh, of those political games, as we see now, are realistically, in order to save uh, or, you know, resist Western sanctions, uh, Mr. Putin's government immediately enacted and make it up and running so-called government program of import substitution with their countermeasures within two tiny short years. Russia is among the biggest 
agricultural product seller in the world. Well, at least with wheat, with uh, pork, with beef, which was never in the history in the last 80 years. Yeah, some uh, other extra pressure helped Russia to do that. The Russian ruble devalued, but the entire economy survived, and that actually paved the ground for huge opportunities for many, many businesses, international players, and some even Chinese who are famous for being, a, used to be a, a, a switch shop for biggest industries from the West in the last 20 years. These days, outsourced production in the Russian Far East because it's cheaper and manpower much more advanced. And that's where, <clears throat> you know, production localization uh, is one of the topics for smart international players like Mercedes-Benz uh, recently announced a new factory establishing next to Moscow, for example. Uh, not to mention Volkswagen, which was doing right after the inaction of the sanctions in 2014, investing over a billion in engine production facility. Uh, again, somewhere not far from Moscow and that kind of stuff. So, why I'm saying about this countermeasures and political debate, they directly related with, uh, again, new opportunities. And those new opportunities, realistically, on the... <clears throat> approved in the last two, three years, that those who are interested in considering uh, this market for steady growth definitely worth the time, at least on researching the topic. And uh, from uh, analysts' reviews and even uh, unofficial comment by agricultural minister who said, well, don't forget that we benefit, our economy benefit out of our countermeasures. In other words, not allowing a ready-made agricultural product coming from the continent, for example, in New Zealand or United States, or that kind of stuff. We established our industries going up and making the products and the entire production competitive. Uh, and he said that recently, I think, just a, just a week ago or so, I don't think our countermeasures will be lifted until 20, uh, 2020. We need some extra time to make ourselves completely sustainable internationally. Again, it seems like a kind of, it might be a kind of, oh, it seems like a uh, typical uh, Russian internal issue, but it's not. In particular, if you keep international investors or entrants in mind, that means that once you are here and you start developing, you register for a thousand dollars, you register structure and uh, start local, whatever it is, even reselling your own product from this with some additional added value and become a Russian tax subject or joint venture, doesn't really matter. Just do it openly and uh, it's very easy. Uh, you immediately become protected and actually eligible to all those incentives, not only for your production, as I said, production localization, one of the hot topics for smart international investors, including Chinese, as I said, and Chinese would never invest a penny unless it would be profitable. And, uh, but more importantly, you have immediate access to this, biggest in Europe uh, consumer market, Russia alone, but not forget, don't forget that Russia is not alone. Russia is a part of Eurasian Economic Union, similar to EEU, we call it EAEU, your Asian Economic Union, which brings you immediate opportunity to 185 mm, million consumers and the biggest advantage, a part of it, it's not even the size of the market, but the market is unsaturated. That's still one of the key features. And that's where the uh, benefits or attractions are. That's how I see it all the time. That uh, you don't mean in, in, in this country, well, when I, when I bring clients from different, different industries, 
in many cases, you know, if you, in many cases, you don't necessarily apply the same approach as you do with, let's say, an American launch of, let's say, IT product, because you think about how big my marketing budget would be. Well, in this case, in Russia, you don't necessarily think about the marketing investments. You think about approaching the right key, key targets. And if you're happy enough, you probably even can, can find a partner who would allow you to sell your product using their client base. Mm. You do not invest a penny, realistically. But it's not, it's going to last for forever, I think. Early adopters so, will be benefiting from that. Yeah, and those uh, those who those countries, including let's Vietnam, which joined, I, I think we can expand on it a little bit later shortly, uh, joined the free trade zone with this country. One of those ways ways to enter this market smoothly, uh, benefit out of the of those opportunities immediately. But again, it's a little bit different model. The uh, sanctions haven't had the effect. Except, in fact, there's a strong argument for sanctions having the exact opposite effect. And what are the countermeasures Russia had? It was food was a big one. Uh, continuing the sanctions on uh, the counter sanctions. So we have sanctions from the West on Russia for doing some mysterious things that can't be explained, and we have counter sanctions from Russia, which is in response to those sanctions. So, and it's is it. Is it mainly food, or it, how, how would you explain these count? Ha, ha, are they going to be expanded now? Now that the Western sanctions are being announced to be extended, what is the Russian response? Could you encapsulate that in a simple uh, idea? Yeah, what uh, yeah, sure. Uh, realistically, uh, if uh, initial Russian counter sanctions of 2014 was kind of, at least uh, as as I look at it as a counter hit in a phase, an unexpected one, because the uh, decree announced in the morning and hundreds of trucks from Poland with apples was just blocked at the border. They didn't know about it a minute before. They didn't, uh, the government did not announce it. They just placed a memo uh, on the government website and immediately sent notification to the customs at nine o'clock in the morning say hey trucks you allowed in let them clean up the others kick them out here is a decree with immediate effect and initially yeah it was kind of a political countermeasure you know punch back uh, with a very sensitive industries hurt realistically because who who are the uh, sellers or suppliers of those uh, food products? Farmers. And the farmers were really hurt, realistically. One of those. So uh, small to medium enterprises uh, supplying those food product or seafood or whatever it is. But uh, once the first year passed over uh, and the ruble devalued twice, it became already clear, but strategically clear, not with immediate proof that, wow, 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 that's a lot of opportunities out of it. Yeah, it was very hot. It was very painful to the Russian population because, you know, your ruble devalued twice. Uh, and the, let's say, real income increased not that dramatically. Realistically, it's decreased. Yeah, you have to get used to it. But on the other hand, you have a lot of a lot of opportunities and only stupids and lazy did not use them. Uh, so these days, uh, based on three years experience of counter sanctions, uh, smart way to apply them to uh, in practical situation is that, as I said, is quite simple. A anyone with, uh, in particular, the interested in this market could uh, just check if of their products are in demand or the knowledge or whatever it is or this service or they can find targets partners and in most cases more often than not 
including, by the way, one of the, uh, sorry for being um, not that consequently, I'm rambling a bit, but one of the litmus tests, I always say, um, uh, look at any economy or developed economy. What a business is quite indicative that the economy is going as a, um, as a market economy. Small businesses, in particular family-run businesses, like little little cafes, little restaurants, or that kind of stuff. When someone asks me, hey, hey, uh, can you bring me uh, some samples? I say, yeah, I live in North Moscow, and uh, in a radius of one kilometer, I have two restaurants only. Can you imagine that? Moscow and its residential area that just demonstrates how unsaturated this market is and it's the simplest business you can do uh, <clears throat> so those niches are countless look at the uh, again typical american model of business franchise look at the subway stories you probably heard about the business case subway in russia what they've been doing in the last few years the annual growth, the least annual growth I heard about is just 150 percent. In in better years, the growth was 400, 500 percent, that that kind of stuff. They're still expanding. It's a model of business which already tested in many many countries, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> it's too far from competition here, so. It's a plethora of opportunities when, with, which are not even being thought over, if you like. Uh, and if someone is interested in anything like that, well, think about sanctions as a, like like uh, following the Chinese uh, approach to opportunity. What opportunity? It's a danger, but it's a, what is that? Uh, it's a it's, it's a threat and opportunities, it's something like that. So realistically, what we can see out of those countermeasures and, and Russian sanctions and Western sanctions, well, a lot of government support, a lot of uh, unfilled niches, uh, a lot of realistically opportunities. Uh, so this, how this I see it. sanctions haven't worked on Russia, uh, they've helped Russia. Sanctions aren't, <laughs> sanctions aren't going to work on investors that are smart enough to find the opportunity in Russia. They will also likewise help those investors, especially the early adopters. And there's no better person to carry a good idea through to fruition than uh, Mr. Stan Grafsky. Well, uh, I would I would just uh, get get in touch with Stan. Um, and uh, hire him out for a month or, or, or three and get some projects moving and start with start with the project that you most want to move uh, agree with Stan about how it, it should get done come to terms get that done and build on on solid things like that on solid projects set the goalposts within a limited time frame get something done and that's the base get another thing done so whether it's establishing some initial sales or uh, initial agreements with, uh, I don't know, manufacturing facilities, or, or maybe it's just to get some retail sales over, over the border and uh, establish a name in a, in a certain small area. Um, whatever, the, whatever the strategy is, work it out with Stan. Um, uh, he, he has very low uh, rates that take into account a base uh, opportunity for investors to you know, explore the market. And then um, you know there may be some bonus structures in there for for big wins where you can both really um, move together uh, towards uh, mutual benefits. Thanks, Stan. That's uh, countermeasures and sanctions. What else do you want to say about that? Well, uh, I think kind kind of a good, uh, uh, not necessarily related with. Um, sanctions and countermeasures, but good example of the whole idea of uh, using Russian market opportunities, probably Vietnam case. Uh, Vietnam concluded a free trade zone agreement with Russia uh, in the last couple of years or so, and it was finally enacted uh, last fall. So realistically, we have some kind of six, seven, <clears throat> a little bit more than that, 
months of, of practical application of, of that free zone. Uh, but the figures, figures of the first few months, and uh, indicate uh, that the uh, uh, this sales or, or bilateral trade the increased kind of uh, forty percent with this uh, four months, but uh, with this seven months. But it's not the key here. I never honestly look into the figures of increased sales as an indications. The indication I believe here is that uh, businesses are much more willing to go in both directions this way because uh, um, Vietnamese I know that from the ground are looking or at least some businesses are looking for partners with their uh, manufacturing facilities or whatever core competences bringing into the Russian uh, either ready-made product or the ones that needs a final tuning and sell it using the Russian distribution channel of existing partners and I also know that a lot of uh, Russian in particular textiles and uh, uh, seafood businesses are looking for opportunities down in Vietnam. They went there. Also, I again, that's I cannot give the names, but I heard from my sources there are some South Asian players who, based on the information received from the Vietnamese partners, uh, they are already using Vietnam as a business base for the entry into this market because realistically it's a free trade agreement which means not necessarily zero taxation but that's uh, privileged tax rates for terms. Vietnam it, it's very beneficial for companies to present themselves as Vietnamese or at least partnering with Vietnamese in order to enter into Russia it makes perfect sense and what a great test case for Putin to show other Asian countries. And you remind me of that uh, when you talked about this Asian economic union that Russia has. One of the statements that Putin had uh, one month, maybe, maybe two or th not possibly three months ago, he made a comment which was very interesting to me about the new Eurasian century. Now, I thought that's very interesting coming from my background in the things that I study because, not, uh, not background necessarily, but interest, there's a document called the New American Century, which predated the all these terror wars. Um, and the project for a New American Century is what the U.S. is doing right now. And the method that they have in mind is exactly the methods that they're employing right now with Ter funding terror groups and bombing countries and stealing resources. That's it. Halliburton, $40 billion from Iraq, and uh, the chief beneficiary is the same one who wants to make the war on fake reasons. Talk about fake news. So here we have the U.S. model of project for a new American century, and here we have Putin's comment about a new Eurasian century. I thought that was fantastic because the, the differences couldn't be more stark. Russia is Europe, Russia is Asia, Russia is Eurasian, Russia is neither, Russia is both. Russia is connected to both, Russia is doing business with both. Russia is long-term um, investing in technology, defense, um, uh, and infrastructure, very important as well with this Silk Road. It's incredible. The last show that we did was on Silk Road. Sorry to ramble on, uh, Stan, but you just sparked my interest. I think Vietnam fits perfectly into the strategy. It's Putin just, he just plays chess, and these guys are playing, I don't know, checkers or marbles or something else. They're not, they don't understand what he's doing. He's, he's defeating them on, on every front, one man against 30 heads of state. But the difference is one man loves his country and represents his people. And those 30 guys, they've sold us out a long time ago. Their whole system's bankrupt. So it is a new, um, it is a new multipolar world that we all want. I represent a large group of people, whether they know it or not. I f I feel as if I represent 
all of the billions of people that don't want to see a new American century dominate the world. Uh, it's better we have a multipolar world with Eurasians working together with, you know, my part, which is down in, uh, yeah. We, we are all a cooperative world if we want to be. It's only the politicians and their paid off structures that want different military industrial complex, namely chief among the chief among them. Um, but so you're getting back to Vietnam as a test case. It's proven. That's your statement. It's proven. It's already. It's, it's a, yeah. And I know there is a there is a number of other uh, free trade agreements, mainly f with countries of Southeast Asia is in the process of discussion. The question is where, when uh, those, uh, those documents are to be finalized, and in particular under, under the angle of most recent adjustment to the pact, uh, which was run by US and uh, with the previous administration, and these days is uh, led by China, uh, by the way, the political uh, level, if someone, if, I don't know if, 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 if your audience saw that or noticed that or not, but it's a very interesting fact. Uh, Mr. S what's his name? Xi Jinping, I, I, I hardly uh, pronounce his name, leader of China, was awarded with the Russian uh, um, highest government. Uh, award recently, St. Andrew's Order, which realistically demonstrates uh, obviously his personal involvement in, in the development of the relationship between the, this, these two countries, Russia and China, but more importantly, it's a demonstration of the uh, counter-involvement of two countries. And I think it's, it's a great sign for uh, again, I, I, I'm pretty distant from all these pol uh, political issues, but I think it's a great sign that uh, all those Chinese-Russian initiatives in economy, uh, whether most of the people outside believe them, they're vital or not, even two, three years ago, now prove to be more than viable, more than sustainable, and that kind of stuff. Look at the comments in the, in the mainstream media, even the Russian uh, Russian comments, or so so-called opposition um, media, uh, saying, wow, Siberia uh, gas pipeline is absolutely unprofitable, something like that. Wow. Bullshit. It's going to be launched soon. It's, 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 it's already proven. Uh, look at the. I understand, I understand it's a big mega contract. So obviously, they're run by government controlled companies. One story, but look at uh, the figures of mm, AliExpress sales into this kind of cross border. Very simple, nothing, nothing to add. Uh, they they increase uh, not just year by year, but these days quarter by quarter. And uh, that proves that uh, the trade between these just two two countries is going up and up and up and up without being any sophistication. As I said, well, uh, production uh, localization would be a little bit more sophisticated. But even in simple trade, cross-border trade, and the uh, most recent Yandex research of uh, data from sales proof and it's in my group linkedin group one of those indicators that sales of cross-border sales going through the roof uh, that means that the uh, market is too far from saturation it's just you know a consumer would vote with their wallet as always well said. Big opportunities in in Russia, and um, Stan is the man to show that. I want to I want to talk just about this. Uh, I've got this. Um, there's a the Saker. Uh, there's a uh, the Saker.is 
is uh, run by a, a, a very pro-Russian analytical and economics um, review of the situation in, in Russia. There's some key findings in an article. This is a very reliable source, um, the Saker.is, Iceland. It's in Iceland um, right now. They, ch they have many different outlets. You can find the Saker and you can look up uh, this article. It's called um, Made in Russia Sitrep 4. So he's done a few Sitreps, situational um, reports. So it's a, I think it's a military term or an intelligence term. Anyway, key findings from this uh, Saker article that just came out. Russian economy has successfully adjusted to dual shock sanctions and oil price plunge. So the dual shock uh, attempt to make Russia collapse, which worked in the Soviet times, didn't work now. There's a minor loss of GDP, just 2.3% for, th for three years of sanctions. That's, that's nothing. And um, will be completely recovered in 2017 with an expected 2 to 3% growth. So sanctions have helped. There's economic numbers that prove it, uh, macro and, uh, and, um, and also in situ situational specific to different regions and different in industries as well, of course. Oil and gas share of GDP drops to below 10%. So everyone says, oh, oil, Russia is very dependent on energy sales. Well, that was true. But you have to understand which Russia we're talking about, the Russia of Yeltsin era or the Russian of Putin era, two absolutely different countries uh, in terms of econ economy and sufficiency. Industrial production stable at 2014 to 2016. And um, it's, it's booming now. It's going up. In, in this year, 2017. Already by May, it's 5.3% growth in 2017, according to the SACR. Uh, Russian economy now is the most diversified in the world. Here it is. Expert, uh, exports remain relatively undiversified, but domestic production highly diversified and self-sufficient. So there we go. And the debt crisis predicted by the Western pundits have failed to materialize. And they go on with a large list. And at the end of the list, they say, however, there are some clear negative data. Salaries, disposable income, and consumption. Retail sales also down. So there are some things that aren't up. But on average, with all of the um, coordinated attacks that Russia has endured, it reminds me really of something like World War II, uh, putting up with so much attacks and then rebounding back and becoming a first world state uh, once again from you know you, you can't beat you can't beat a good uh, idea or good people uh, they just keep coming back and uh, Russia's proven that again and again and again I'd much rather have one Russian friend uh, than one Russian enemy uh, that's for sure I, I, I'd rather have uh, any number of fake friends than one Russian enemy to be sure but uh, yeah, I, I thought that was quite interesting to, to review uh, everyone saying the same thing, even the IMF and World Bank. Um, another article that I have here, just wrapping up with my own um, sort of research for this. Paul Craig Roberts was a U.S. Treasury Secretary. He worked under Ronald Reagan, and he is considered the founder or at least co-founder of Reaganomics, which was a big thing to us in mm. America at the time. So he's, a, he's an important Washington insider who knows what he's talking about. And he's been pro-Russia since day one. I mean, not so much pro-Russia, that's my terminology. He's been on the side of truth since day one, and he's seen through the lies since day one because he knows the people, he knows who's lying, he knows how they lie. He's, he's an intelligence guy, he's an economics guy, he's a, he's a political guy. And he, this is Dr. Craig Roberts right here, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. According to the Russian press, the Chinese and Russian governments are concluding a joint military agreement. It has to do with the common face alliance against the United States. So there we go. We're not only talking about economic cooperation, we're talking about preparing, because if you don't prepare for bad things, the bad things will be invited to happen more easily. Mm -hmm. This Russian, Russian and Chinese uh, cultures go back thousands of years. It's not a hundred year old country or 200. When we, the United States, this is Paul Craig Roberts again, go in there and remove these secular leaders in the Middle East, we create chaos 
and then the chaos helps to foment jihadism. Then it extends to the next country. See, he's, he's showing how the new American century functions on profits of those oil stolen from these countries. So it has been our strategy, and I think it's recognized by Russia and China, and it's directed at them. So uh, the word is out. Everyone understands. It becomes a factor when there's a run on the dollar. So that's how uh, Paul, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts sees this coming to an end, when there's a run on the dollar. So if, if, if Russia and Iran and all these other countries, as Iraq tried to do, as Libya tried to do, to make their own currency uh, sales on, the, on energy sales, uh, getting away from the petrodollar, that's really the Achilles heel of this giant uh, warmongering machine, ending the petrodollar, ending the fiat, uh, the, the power of the privately owned Federal Reserve over the politicians and courts and industries and, and big banks, big financing uh, companies, obviously the press and, and politicians as well. So come, bringing that to an end, is going to be very hard because although Donald Trump talked a, a nice message in the beginning of his, some of his message was quite positive, it looks like he's held hostage according to this other article that I've printed up that I found relevant by Stephen Lenben. Uh, he says that Trump is hostage to bipartisan anti-Russia neocons infesting his administration and Congress. No amount of one-on-one -on -one talks with Putin will improve bilateral relations as long as America's imperial agenda remains unchanged. And it looks like it will remain unchanged for a while. So it looks like there will be a continuation of sanctions for a while. Um, but we don't know. It could end at any time. And when it does end, all those people that have taken advantage of this opportunity will be in a very good position to benefit. Uh, not only themselves and their, their pocketbook and the people they work with, but also um, being a uh, feeling good about yourself, doing the right thing, going out there and making something happen in, in a way that benefits yourself, but also does something better for the world. Because these, these fake aggressive, uh, there's fake reasons for making aggression, whether it's economic or otherwise, uh, they should be challenged by all of us who have just one life to live. We can get more money, we can't get more time. We have to make time count, Stan. We have to do what's right. So let's let's help our investors get across the border, meet you, get their products into the system. And you've got lots of stories. If someone has a question about your credibility or your knowledge, see who you are. They get a sense of uh, you as a person. And, and I've heard other people say that that comes through loud and clear. Just listen to you. This is unscripted. This is unedited. This is uncut. You see us for who we are. Our flaws are coming out. We're not professionals. We're just people. We're just talking. We just have a passion, and and we when we put our mind to something, we get it done, Stan. So um, thanks for joining me on this uh, on this. Well, I guess you can call it a presentation to investors into the new Russia, the second Russia boom since I've been alive. Well, I hope it, it finally could be called as a boom. Uh, my feeling, most of uh, at least. Uh, Western countries reps, uh, they kind of a little bit confused, you know, on one story they are under pressure of mainstream media and uh, fears they, uh, they got from there as a consequences of those informational information attacks. On the other hand, when when you start dealing with them, you, you see, you know, absolutely rational people and they understand everything. It's so simple that wow. But it it, it takes time to to um, to bring or to prove that the opportunities are really here and uh, there's nothing horrible which sometimes I hear from <laughs> from mainstream media. In, in this country, you know, but it takes time. Yeah. Let's leave all your links as usual, Stan. People can get in touch with you on LinkedIn. They can reach you on. Um, well, we will leave other contact in for you. That you've got a website. You've got email. You've got a phone. I'm not sure if you want to make that 
uh, public. You probably do have a phone on your website. Yeah, all all the telephone numbers, every, everything is just quite quite open. Um, okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm contactable anytime except for the night. Okay, very good. And um, and uh, obviously we'll continue these talks uh, from time to time. This is just coming a, a in front of the big Trump Putin meeting, yeah. and uh, we didn't really we didn't really talk about the big Trump Putin meeting. Everyone's building it up into something as if it's going to be a transformational event. I don't believe it will be, but it could point to some interesting developments. That's the most hope I have for this event in Hamburg in, on the 7th and 8th, or, well, tomorrow and the next day, I think? Yeah, it's uh, 7th and 8th, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. But, uh, well, we already had the first experience, you know, uh, making forecasts on uh, on uh, positive changes after Trump would came to the power over a half yeah. a year ago. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. Probably we were over-optimistic. <laughs> yeah. I was over-optimistic. I, I admit that I have been naive on a number of different fronts. I always think that we're rounding the corner, but I um, underestimate the power of those who have control, clearly. But I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Being naively optimistic is good, so long as you back it up with determination to see it through. <laughs> yeah, let's, and let's I want, see. And I'm going to see it through. I'm, I'm not going to quit. Actually, I would be happy to get back to this topic after uh, after that meeting. Uh, at least we'll have some some results. What is out there? Because uh, I can hear quite a conflicting, or, you know, sometimes uh, unrelated between themselves uh, comments from different sources saying that, you know, Putin is not prepared, which is bullshit, obviously. Putin's always prepared. He's a KGB guy. Uh, uh, but uh, the administration is not prepared, or they put pedal on, on the brake, or something like that. Uh, again, let's see it first and see what, what comes out of it. And then uh, we'll have uh, some thoughts. Actually, <laughs> knowing that as you call him, uh, Mr. Putin is a, a great chess master. He might 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 make an offer too, which rational Mr. Trump would not deny, because it's all about rationalism. It's all about common yeah. sense in the first place. It is. It is. I thought Putin handled um, the president of Turkey and the Turkish situation very very deftly, very incredibly, like a master, absolute master. Here we had Turkey pulled over to the US, uh, incentivized by the EU, the magic of the EU. So he was hypnotized. He actually was bombing, he actually shot a MiG out of the sky. He was, he was killing, he was killing Russians. He was fighting for ISIS, hitting Assad on behalf of the US uh, partnership. And he ended the oil for, for a while. It's restarted recently, uh, thanks to the um, diplomacy and forgiveness of, of Putin to put, because Putin doesn't hold grudges. If, he does, if it's better for his people to not hold a grudge, he'll let it go. That is, that is so far beyond what we consider a master statesman. That is beyond mastery of statesmanship, to, to put your own grudges down, which are obviously very deeply felt, uh, this betrayal of, of shooting a MiG from behind, which was considered to be friendly, uh, you know, the, by the Turkish military, and then to, uh, you know, to, to enter into the game against Russian interests, against Syrian interests, against the, the people. It, it's absurd uh, to bring in all this ISIS oil at one half or one third the, the market rates. Uh, that was a big incentive, billions of dollars, and there's videos of, of them going back and forth through the Turkish border that were put, published uh, and, and admitted. But what did Putin do? Um, he, put, he, put da he put his ego down, and now he's got energy agreements with Turkey. He's got the pipeline back on stream. Um, Turkey is turning uh, its back politically on the United States, and Turkey has presented itself as 
willing to uh, go after militarily after ISIS. Now, I know that the Kurdish situation is, is part of that picture, but Putin would understand that as well. So I, I, I'm, I'm in awe. I'm in awe at just to watch Putin run circles around these other leaders on Ukraine, on Syria, on the sanctions, on the economy. On, on, so I, I agree with you. He's going to pull a rabbit out of a hat like a magician. Once again, when he's in Hamburg, uh, he might. Don't, I wouldn't put it past him. We, we just need to watch this guy. Uh, he's on fire. He's, he's gifted. Let's just put it like that. Maybe even watched over by some powerful uh, higher spiritual entities, knowing that uh, time is short on the earth unless we get some sensible people uh, involved in, in politics, because it hasn't been much sense um, coming from the West in recent decades. Yeah. Well, so with that, I guess I'm, I'm finished. I, I, I said more than I, I took more time than I should have from you. You you presented a great case here for investors. Uh, once again, Stan, and you and you've presented the, the timeliness of it, and you've addressed which sectors can benefit and how to benefit, and the mentality of how to benefit. Folks, this is free information. If you're technology, if you want to go to Russia, if you want to, I mean, he said it, it's the taxes are low, establish yourself as a taxpayer. That's what Russia wants. The funds are there. The time is now. Investigate. It's not, not expensive. You can keyword search a lot of this. You can investigate with similar industries that you know, that we, where countries you're familiar with and start there. Then give Stan a call and give him the hard questions. I would suggest going on, on a route like that. Get comfortable yourself to level A. Then on level B, identify those questions you believe are challenging. Go to Stan. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, from my side, definitely, I'll be happy to comment to any, any un unconvenient or unpleasant questions if some people consider them, whatever it is. Uh, if I don't know, my answer is always I don't know. It's as simple as that. Uh, Spoken like a Russian. <laughs> don't, don't you have some fancy way of saying you don't know in such a way that people think you know, but you... you, you, you well, uh, <laughs> uh, actually, it's funny. It's a funny question. You know why? Um, uh, originally, I'm not from Moscow. I'm not Moscovite. And uh, as the guy who uh, moved, it, uh, moved into Moscow in, in the 90s, initially, I was kind of... Uh, you know, shy, you know, admiring all these Muscovites as so a gifted people, they say me gods or something like that. It's, it's a quite kind, kind of uh, um, typical complex, psychological complex of provincial people. And uh, when I joined uh, a US law firm, <laughs> Uh, I was listening carefully to, to my colleagues at the end of uh, when I finally uh, became a partner of it. But uh, initially I was listening, a lot of it. And sometimes I was listening and hearing a lot of bullshit going into the client and client was, you know, just consuming, consuming, consuming. Yeah. And I was just keeping my mouth shut. And the magic answer to your question was articulate a number of uh, times by my colleagues when they have absolutely no idea about the question even where it's coming from and don't even understand whether it's law or it's uh, some you know economics or whatever it is the question is to make a pause first and say you know uh, this topic is not directly interpreted in the Russian law it requires extra research because we're very much responsible to our clients we do not want to mislead you so if you we would be very much happy to help so it's not going to cost you a lot just two three hours of hours of our time so you know we'll and we'll prepare a, <laughs> a report and some people paid of course of course uh, but when I was listening to that, and th that story was repeating in other law firms I dealt with, or we were partnering with, and when I was on my own already. But th th after that, I already was listening and said, oh, shit, I had that bullshit before. <laughs> that says you know nothing. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hey, no, uh, realistically, I, I try to be honest. I'm not sure whether all the time or not all the time, but I'm prepared to say I don't feel shame saying I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I have a friend in St. Petersburg, and I, 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 uh, I remember his statement. He says that, generally speaking, Russians are um, much better to deal with as you get further away from Moscow. And he married someone from Magadan. <laughs> Actually, I think that's true. People are much more open. And yeah. with so-called crowns on, on their heads, they don't consider themselves, you know, kind of uh, established or elite people or that kind of stuff, you know. Like. But, but I do, I do have, just for clarity, I know some friends will be watching this. I do have good friends in Moscow, even Moscovites, and you can find good people everywhere, really. So the old, you know, stereotypes yeah, that's true. are fun. Of course. But, yeah. Uh, that's uh, it's just uh, one of those approaches which are present and the same story I heard from New York or from my very clo closest friend in the United States he's in from San, Fran San Francisco and he was saying it's the same about states if you talk about New York and and San Francisco or LA you know kind yeah. of uh, certain groups of snobbish people and the rest is just from kind of countryside something like that Stan, I think we've accomplished a lot uh, here with this show. It's probably could have been run more professionally or structured, but there's something about unstructured approaches uh, I think that people can appreciate now in this overly structured, overly refined uh, mass media world. Uh, I, and I think, I think we have a place in that. It, whether it's big or small, I think it doesn't matter. We're doing it because we enjoy it and we see a purpose in it, and I'm fine with that. Thanks for joining me, Stan. I'm always ready to support you. You've supported me in Moscow. You support the company that uh, that I founded, and it's a pleasure to work with you in business and uh, and in, in friendship. So thanks for joining me again for this show, Stan. And uh, goodbye to everyone. We'll be back. Uh, Thank uh, you just very much. Make sure we have any questions. Check in the notes, and we'll we'll link you up with Stan. You can save your best questions for Stan. Thank you very much, Tate. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye. Bye.